Welcome to the first lecture of uh, the Ninfaes for uh, the uh, for the uh, year. Oh, sorry. That, that's great. Um, it's great to see all of you, uh, the newcomers, uh, the people that have been here before, and also the uh, new assistant professors from the Ninfaes. Uh, there are already many here. Um, you will uh, have the chance to introduce yourself afterwards. So there is a little reception, so please uh, uh, greet everybody. I want to welcome uh, Kari. Hi, Kari Rumukanian is a professor at the University of Helsinki. And Kari is one of my favorite researchers. <laughs> he's, uh, he's outstanding and has been doing great work in, uh, prevalently in uh, lattice quantum field theory. And, but applying to many, many different things from QCD and the temperature uh, all the way to gravitational waves and what you can do with that. As you know, there's been a Nobel Prize in gravitational waves this year and I'm sure Kelly was going to talk about that. The list of achievements and uh, successes and prizes that uh, Kelly has got is immense. So I won't really bore you with that, but I say that there's been assistant professor in Florida. That's when I first met him, when I came from the States. And then mm -hmm. he's been a San fellow, sorry, San, uh, San staff member. And then he's been uh, Brookhaven, and uh, again as assistant professor. So I would say that there is, uh, besides his uh, outstanding pedigree, he's actually a really, really fantastic researcher. I leave the floor to Carrie, and thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you, <coughs> and thank, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I've been here a few times before, but not nearly as often as I would have liked to, I mean, because of all kind of work-related uh, issues that one cannot always come to, come to the meetings here. And, uh, but I have been, uh, as Francisco mentioned, I mean, five years in Denmark, in Copenhagen, as a kind of at the turn of the millennium. <coughs> as an uh, uh, assistant. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about gravitational waves from the early universe and what can we do with them, can we observe them, and, and, and what they can tell us about physics. Uh, first I would like to ask that how many of you are not physicists? Okay, <laughs> good, 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 great. I am, the, the, my, my talk, I, I am I'm ashamed to admit, there are few formulas in there, but, but uh, the, in principle it should be uh, understandable. I mean, interrupt me if you, if you want to ask questions. So, as, as you all know, I mean, a couple of years back there was a literally earth-shaking event on, 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 on 14th of September at 11.50.45 on, on local time, uh, a pulse of gravitational wave went through us all and literally moved us all. It also was a very moving event. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, those were observed. That was the first observation of gravitational waves, observed by the LIGO gravitational wave detector. And this originated from uh, from merger of two black holes, about 36 and 29 solar masses, they were or orbiting each other and losing energy and spiraling faster and faster, <coughs> boom, hitting each other. And that causes huge, huge amplitude of gravitational wave. It was far away, I don't know the truth how far away it was, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, really in a cosmological distance from us. But nevertheless, the, the signal was so strong that, uh, that it was uh, detectable on these detectors. And those waves are the kind of the signal from the two different detectors. <coughs> and this really opened a new window to the universe. First time gravitational waves have been observed. It was very appropriate because it was almost exactly 100 years before this observation when Einstein predicted gravitational waves. So it, it took really 100 years to, to observe it and 101 years for the birth of the general theory of relativity which kind of contains all of these solutions. <coughs> and of course, to, in, in due course, these people who were the main culprits in this endeavor of detecting these gravitational waves got the Nobel Prize last year. Um, Yes, 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, the detection of gravitational waves is a long history, as I mean, well, when I was a school kid, people were already trying to detect gravitational waves, but of course, I mean, in hindsight, it was hopeless that they didn't have the technology. But uh, during the decades since, I mean, of course, the things have changed, and, and, and finally this remarkable achievement was achieved. And currently, <coughs> there are active gravitational wave detectors around the world. Um, here are the American LIGO detectors in Washington, and, and, and uh, what state was that? I forgot now. Louisiana, not Louisiana. Yeah, it was in Louisiana, yeah. <coughs> yes, <coughs> near, near New Orleans. And, uh, and uh, advanced virtual detector in Italy, and they, these three form a collaboration kind of they are synchronized uh, detectors. In Japan, a new detector Kagra is, uh, is being built, is, is soon coming online. In India, similar detector is, is planned, like India, and in Germany there's a smaller detector, but it's too small to see really anything small, like a technology prototype. And how these work, I mean, this is kind of the picture of one of the LIGO detectors in, in Washington state. You have two uh, arms, which are four kilometers of length, orthogonal to each other, and, and a laser beam is sent along these, these arms and reflected back. It's like here, I mean, there's a laser beam splitter, and which splits the beam in, in two arms, and they are reflected back and, and, and combined again here. And <coughs> when, when uh, things are kind of at rest, in quotation marks, these um, beams cancel each other somehow. The wave crests emerge here so that they are exactly opposite of each other and you have no signal here. However, when the gravitational wave comes, what does it do here? It moves freely floating objects slightly. It kind of shrinks and expands the space-time. These mirrors here at the end are suspended so that they can move free. They are suspended and isolated extremely, extremely carefully. And, and when the gravitational wave comes, it slightly wobbles this and, and that one, but to opposite directions. <coughs> boom, 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 boom. There's a nice animation what you can find in YouTube here. And it means that these don't exactly anymore cancel. So you get some signal here, and that's the, then what you measure. This is, of course, extremely simplified. Actually, the laser beam bounces back and forth several hundred times in order to amplify the effect, and, and they are all kind of, uh, kind of uh, fine-tuned there. And the strain is just astounding. Um, strain is the relative change in the length. It's one part in, in 10 to the 20 which means that even though this is four kilometers, the movement here is less than the size of the atom, is less than the size of the nucleus of the atom, is one thousand of the size of the proton. And you can still observe it. And to, somehow, I'm, I'm a theorist, so to me it, it seems impossible. I mean, if somebody tells you that you can measure distance to one thousandth of the size of the proton, I would say, oh, it doesn't work. But that's part of the reason why it took hundred years. To, to really observe this. <coughs> of course, the, the reason why you can observe such a small movement, I mean, atoms are coarse lumps, but when you have a huge amount of atoms, like in a big mirror, then you can move the, see the collective movement to much more accurately than the single atom size. <coughs> so, sources, where do these originate, this gravitational wave? And astrophysics is, of course, the primary source of what these instruments are now doing. Binary compact object mergers. Binary compact objects are kind of two binary systems of, of, of very heavy <laughs> stars, like black holes, which are the most densest objects, or neutron stars, which are the second most densest objects in, in, in the space. And uh, indeed, this LIGO and uh, virtual collaboration has now seen five like all pairs, or at least published five, they might have seen more, and actually one, which is kind of uh, comsi, comsa, I mean halfway event, halfway might be not an event, so that they don't say that it's certain, but one collision of neutral stars also, which was published last year, last fall, 
And that has already had a big, big impact, I will tell you about it a bit later. <coughs> Supernova are also a source of gravitational waves, but nothing has been yet observed. And one can argue that, okay, LIGO cannot see, it's, it's not sensitive enough. Or the supernova should be very close to us. And that can happen, but supernovas are not so common objects that, let's say, within our galaxy or, or, or within the next galaxy, so that uh, they, they could be observed. <coughs> these black holes are not too common, I mean, these big black holes here, are not too common objects as this binary systems, but because the signal is so strong, you see them extremely far away. That's, that's why they have seen already five of them. However, however, while these are, of course, the things what the astronomers are excited about as a particle physicist, I'm exci ex more excited about another source of gravitational wave, the early universe. And one talks about primordial gravitational waves. Because in the Big Bang, of course, the universe starts in an extremely hot, dense system and expands rapidly and cools. And you can expect that violent events may happen there. And those can generate gravitational waves. Gravitational wave production is, is strongly enhanced when you have a large energy density. It's, it's really, really, really kind of strongly dependent on the energy density. That's why Although I'm waving my hands, I'm producing gravitational waves all the time, they have no effect on you, or, well, not observable effect, because the energy density is so small. But uh, when you have a black holes which are doing this kind of movement or spiraling each other, energy densities are huge, and that's why they are strong producers of gravitational waves. <coughs> Early universe, the energy densities were enormous, I mean, they were millions of times larger than, than in, let's say, normal matter in its density, or billions of times. <coughs> it's much easier to produce gravitational waves. And those then, are having been produced, then are just propagating through the universe and waiting for us to detect them. That's exactly similar way to the famous microwave background, which was all, already also produced at the early universe, and now it is being observed. <coughs> Now, one interesting fact is that the known physics, the standard model of particle physics, which contains all of, all of our theories which we know about, cannot produce gravitational waves. Okay, so you would say, okay, then you don't have these things, which is possible. However, if you observe gravitational waves from early universe, then it tells you, okay, there must be something which is not within our standard model some new physics theories, which there is plenty of room in, in the nature for new physics theories. We just don't, haven't measured, observed that, because of the limited energy range, what, what we can do on Earth. <coughs> so, observation of these primordial gravitational waves would be a signal of new physics, physics beyond the standard model. And I think it's almost certain that if this uh, thing happens, if they are observed, I mean, that's an almost certain Nobel Prize for the people who, who did this observation. <coughs> this is complementary with the particle physics uh, searches on accelerators, in the sense that, that now you, you look at the, at the different, different phenomena, and in principle you can, you can reach much, much higher energy, because early universe, you had almost arbitrarily high energies, not arbitrarily high energies, but enormously high energies available, which are not just possible to do technologically on Earth, so that the much more exotic events might have happened than, than we can ever produce on particle accident. And one, one physics, particle physics outcome already has been produced by these gravitational wave observ observations. The, the dense nuclear matter equation of state that uh, when you, when you, I mean, the neutron stars are here, two neutron stars. Of course, these are the remnants of the supernova star that explodes, and if it is not too big, it, it might, so that it collapses in the black hole, it might produce a neutron star, which is essentially a star mass atomic nucleus. It's so dense, 
gravitational pull is so strong that the, all the matter compresses to atomic nucleus density. It is in principle like an atomic nucleus, but its mass is about two solar masses or a bit more. <coughs> and and, and uh, how, how it behaves depends on the strong interactions and, and to, to the nuclear matter equation of state, one says, that how it behaves. When you compress, how much it resists the compression. And that this is not a really hard question. We don't have good tools to analyze this, theoretically. Experimentally, we cannot do it on Earth. I mean, you, you don't have a hydraulic press which can produce neutronic matter. I mean, no way. And not even in explosions. I mean, you can even explode, let's say, atomic bombs or use some bombs and try to produce that. It doesn't, doesn't work, work like that. You, you, you don't get enough, enough density. You can only get this kind of density at the scale of atomic nucleus when you, let's say, smash two atomic nuclei together. But you don't reach this high density <coughs> of this in this neutral star. And the, the thing is, this is kind of funny picture. <coughs> this is the radius of the neutral star versus the mass of the neutral mass in solar masses. And this, this is the theoretical band of uncertainty. And as you see, I mean, there's a huge range of uncertainty on the radius of the neutral stars. For example, this 1.5 solar masses, it could be somewhere here. <coughs> Almost factor of two. And there are no observations, direct observations. I mean, how can you tell if some object in the sky is is 14 kilometers or, or, or 9 kilometers when it is in somewhere and the other side of the Milky Way. I mean, there's no way. <coughs> However, when they collide, of course, they approach each other, they deform each other, and you can deduce the, 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 the stiffness of the matter, the size of the, of the stars. And that constrains now your equation of state. And, for example, this red band there has been one observation of neutron stars. We know that this red band here cannot be realized in nature. So, so already one observation is, is, has limited the allowed radius and uh, mass relation of the stars. This blue band actually is, is excluded because we know that they are heavier than two solar mass neutron stars and that cannot support this. It's kind of funny actually the, 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 when you look at the neutron stars here mass radius relation. If you have a two solar mass neutron star here, it has assuming that this is this boundary is the correct equation of state, it is about 12 kilometers of radius. You took stuff out of it, so make it lighter. The radius doesn't change. It's somehow because you take mass out of it, it the gravitational pull weakens, it expands. And its radius is practically constant here until it becomes uh, kind of very light and then this it's not anymore being pulled to the atomic nucleus density it starts to expand rapidly to the let's say normal star stellar density so it becomes of course thousands of kilometers well millions of kilometers at some point so that uh, well not millions whatever is the solar radius <coughs> but there's a bit uncertainty and when we get more observations of course i mean this can be pinned down and from the theory of strong interactions, it's very, very hard to do these calculations. Numerical lattice simulations are the best tool to study these interactions, but at high density, they don't work because of so-called notorious sign problem. I'm not going into that here. But let us look at the events in the early universe. Thermal history. We are here. That now. The universe, the, mean, the average temperature is 2.7 Kelvin, <coughs> close to absolute uh, zero temperature, of course, space is cold, space is cold. And, and here is the time, uh, age of the universe in a logarithmic scale. <coughs> and uh, for example, all of the stars formed here, so that, and, 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 uh, and the galaxies, etc., life formed here, it, uh, all interesting stuff for us I mean, happened here, I'm very close to the present time here. But you have lots and lots of logarithmic time for particle physics events to happen. Somehow, when you plot it in a logarithmic scale, it becomes somehow jumps in your face that the, 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 the most of the universe was actually very hot and dense early universe state. 
So here is the galaxy formation. Universe is about hundreds of millions, billion years old. This is the famous microwave background was emitted here. If I go backwards here, heat up kind of the universe, at that temperature, uh, the, the electrons are kicked off of the atoms, atomic nucleus. So that at earlier times here, it was so hot that the matter was fully ionized. If you were sitting on a, on a space, space suit there at, at that age universe, you wouldn't see anything because, uh, because you have three electrons and an atomic nucleus. It's like sitting in milk. I mean, it's completely opaque, glowing, white hot stuff. Light doesn't propagate. But when the universe cooled after this point, electrons were captured, and suddenly the universe became transparent for light, and this microwave background then was, was free to propagate through the universe, and now we observe. When we go backwards, 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 it has one year old universe, one hour old universe, nothing much interesting happens here. Then here, about one minute time scale, nucleosynthesis happens. <coughs> happened. Uh, atomic nuclei were formed, so that when we go backwards, the nuclei are split, split apart here. So you get three protons, three neutrons. Oops, I went to here. <coughs> and when we go even backwards one second, there was interesting things about neutrinos, but I'm not talk about that. Uh, here, then, when we are at the microsecond level, age of the universe, so-called QCD phase transition happened, which means that the, if we go backwards now in, in the, towards earlier universe, the, the protons and neutrons melt into quarks and gluons. We get so-called quark-gluon plasma at higher temperatures. <coughs> at higher temperatures. And when we go even, even further back 1,000 times higher uh, uh, temperatures, we get so-called electroweak phase transition temperature, where the, one can say that the so-called Higgs field turned on, where the Higgs mechanism acted. <coughs> and and many, many interesting events may have happened there, we are not sure. For example, the baryon number, or simply matter of the universe, may have been generated during that. And gravitational waves may be produced here depending on the properties what happens here. <coughs> the known physics is here. I mean, what we know, the standard model contains all of this stuff. I mean, the, 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 the closer to the Big Bang, I mean, Big Bang is principle here at the minus infinity, you go, the less you know for certain about these things. <coughs> and, and, and kind of here is where, I know, where our knowledge stops. The particle accelerators are just able to reach this level, but not, not higher. We don't know the details what happened there. And these are these two points, which have, I have kind of highlighted here, are possible points of, for the phase transition in the early universe. And those are the, can produce gravitational waves. Even earlier times, I mean, we, we know little, I mean, nothing for sure, and lots of speculations, of course, all kind of uh, interesting stuff, let's say, inflation might have happened here, which is this explosive uh, expansion of the universe, where there are lots of kind of indirect evidence that that might have happened, but it's by no means certain that that, that happened there. I'm not going to talk much about that inflation here. And here uh, we, we finally reach Planck scales, they all kind of string theories, etc then take over, and, and even less is known. <coughs> now, particle accelerators can probe physics just at here. This, if, this, if there is kind of events which produce gravitational waves, we can, we can probe all the way here and even inflation with gravitational waves. So that it's an, it's an probe which, which can reach huge energy scales. And the sources of these gravitational waves, inflation is one of them, what I mentioned. And some of you might remember, at least physicists, particle physicists, this bicep thing a few years back, which, uh, which was, uh, they, they studied this microwave 
background radiation and they observe one particular polarization pattern for it. And that pattern arises naturally if there are gravitational waves in the, during this infla inflationary process, this kind of whirling pattern of polarizations. However, that turned out to be a mistake or probably a foreground contamination, so some stuff in between, I mean, in our galaxy or, or, or interstellar matter can have produced that, so that, they, that kind of went away, but I mean, things are going on there. <coughs> So-called cosmic strings are, are also uh, very strong producers of gravitational waves. If you have some kind of very exotic phase transition, you can produce vortex lines. You see those in, for example, <coughs> liquid crystals when you do phase transitions or, or superconductors <coughs> also already in condensed matter. Similar lines could, could be produced there. It's kind of vibrate like guitar strings and, and, and make loops and string away. They, they can produce gravitational waves. <coughs> but I'm not going to talk about those either. They are very speculative theories. First of the phase transitions are kind of well established. They, they happen, of course, all around us. Water boils, freezes. Those are first of the phase transitions. And they can happen in particle physics theories. But unfortunately, they do not exist in, in, in standard model. There are two candidates where it could be in this so-called QCD transition and electroweak transition. But now we know that they are not first order. When I was a student, or when I started studying, I mean, it was still open question whether these are first order or not. But now, now it has vanished for both. But strong transition is still possible in many extensions of the standard model. I mean, these new physics theories, exciting theories which have new particles and, and interactions. There are many, many, many candidates. And uh, observing this gives a direct snapshot of the universe at the time when they were created, generated. Because when the, when, when the gravitational waves are generated, they proceed to the universe basically without any interaction of the matter. So that they, they, they really, when they are emitted, they interact so weakly with the matter. That's why they are so, so hard to observe that, that, that they basically don't care about, the, about the whatever medium they are going through. <coughs> Expected frequency for the gravitational waves from the early universe is about millihertz range, so basically one oscillation in, a, in an hour. So, so the, the frequency is, is pretty low, but, but still technically doable. I mentioned here the standard model status here. <coughs> we know now, didn't know, let's say 30 years ago, what happens in the standard model. We have a theory of strong interactions called QCD. It has quantum chromodynamics. It has a phase transition at 170 MeV, phase transition in quotation marks, because it's not really, strictly speaking, it's a smooth crossover. Phase transition would mean that there is some kind of discontinuity or, 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 or non-smooth behavior. And, and what happens in this transition is that the patterns are protons, neutrons, and all other hadrons uh, melt into quark gluon plasma, which is kind of forage of quark, quarks and gluons. And this, this is now routinely produced in particle accelerators. I mean, you smash two atomic nuclei, let's say gold or uranium, or big enough atomic nuclei in particle colliders to each other, it produces a tiny block of this quark gluon plasma. Of course, it expands and, and, and freezes immediately, but you can still study the physics of this plasma. And there is no first order transition there. <coughs> Theoretically, I mean, one can study this using lattice QCD simulations. <coughs> and that is well established. 1,000 times higher. These units are now in particle physics units. I mean, <coughs> it doesn't mean anything to print them in Kelvin, so that I didn't try even to, even to, to convert. But this is 1,000 times higher temperature than this. This is mega electron volts, giga electron volts. <coughs> uh, and here the Higgs field turns on. And one can, I mean, typically, I mean, shows this as a cartoon, kind of the, the, the Higgs, so-called Higgs potential, which is, which is uh, at high temperatures, has a minimum at the zero. It, at this temperature, it develops another minimum block, and the Higgs 
Higgs kind of drops in this nother minimum and at zero temperature <coughs> at our present day universe, I mean it sits here. And and for this for the functioning of the standard model it's essential that the Higgs is somehow here at the non zero value of the of the of the potential. This quite for example gives for masses for the elementary part. And this could have been first order, so that this jump could have been abrupt some temperature, but it turns out now that it's a smooth crossover. It was in the 20 years ago, I mean, I was involved in many of the calculations where we studied this, and, 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 and with the physical Higgs mass, it was now found at LHC at CERN uh, five years ago, and, and it's, it's so heavy that it cannot be first order. <coughs> There's also connection with the matter of the universe, so called baryon number here, that at these high temperatures the baryon number can actually change. It's not fixed. At, here at low temperatures the matter cannot vanish blocks to, to empty air. I mean, matter is stable as far as we know. I mean, we, we haven't observed any <coughs> decay of, of protons. However, at, at this very high temperature that is possible. And so that uh, there is a possibility that the matter is created during this process. But it's a very complicated and standard model can do. <coughs> One can kind of uh, quantify this by plotting the pressure of the matter. I mean particle matter as, as the units of temperature. If I just heat up space, volume, to, to, to higher and higher temperatures, this band is where the QCD phase transition happens, 100 MeV, and this is where the electroweak phase transition happens. It's a completely smooth and, 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 and not much features in this phenomenon. <coughs> this is 2006, 10 years old, but, and, and it has slightly changed, but I mean, no conclusion. Conclusions are the same here anyway. So this is, yeah. No, no phase transitions there. But the, this Higgs field transition, what I showed, in the standard model it was smooth, <coughs> no transition at all. But it is not certain that the standard model is the model which describes this. There, it, it, there could be something else besides the standard model there, because we haven't been able to study it conclusively in the particle accelerators. There's lots of room for kind of enlargements. And in, in some, these are called extensions of the standard model. And these can have a first order phase transition. Or you can, you can have a new theory which, which, is, which comes in at, at a mu still much higher energies than the standard model or, or the electroweak scale and, and that can have phase transitions. <coughs> Uh, and, and if the phase transition is of first order, like the boiling of water at normal pressure, it, it proceeds through bubble nucleation. So that imagine that we have, are in this hot phase and we are cooling it down towards this critical temperature, the temperature where this transition would happen, like with the vapor uh, liquid water, I mean, 100 at the normal pressure, 100, 100 degrees centigrade. <coughs> when we cool down to this temperature, nothing happens at that temperature, because first of the transitions have always metastability. There's a barrier for anything to happen. You have to cool down it, super cool, or super heat if you go to the opposite direction. You super cool, and, and uh, the, the stronger the transition, well, maybe usual, the stronger the transition is, the more you can super cool it, until it becomes kind of probable to nucleate bubbles of the new phase. They are microscopic at the beginning. Like the boiling of water, you get tiny droplets which starts to ex ex expand. And then these, these droplets, because they are the favored phase, after all, they start to rapidly expand and, and, uh, and cover then the whole phase. Boom, and the transition is complete. This is a violent process if you have a big energy density involved here, and that produces gravitational waves. This is, these are actually snapshots of, of our numerical simulations of this, of this process. <coughs> so, I mean, on, the, on, the, on, the, on these particle physics experiments, we don't have any 
sign of beyond the standard model, this BSM means beyond the standard model, meaning that something which is not in the standard model of our particle physics. They, 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 they are hints, of course, we already know they are hints of beyond the standard model of physics, like the dark matter, which is seen in gravitational, gravitationally in the galaxies, galaxy movements. It's probably some exotic particle, which doesn't belong to the standard model. But uh, we haven't been able to catch it, I mean, see it. I mean, we just see that they stuck in, 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 in space. <coughs> but this would kind of give a completely new angle to this BSM. Yeah. And what is the instrument which we can <laughs> use here? It's LISA which is a similar interferometer as the LIGO, but now in space. It's a triangular constellation of three satellites, which are 2.5 million kilometers from each other on the, on the present kind of the technological document. They are shooting laser beams to bomb bomb between each other's back and forth and measuring the distances from each other. This is a huge distance, by the way, <coughs> 10 times Earth moon. Distance. So it, it's it's an enormous, enormous constellation. Of course, there's no matter here. I mean, it's it's in vacuum it, 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 between the satellites. They are just pointing lasers to each other, and they are able. These these are able to measure the distances to each other again to one part more better than one part in ten to twenty, or, or one and twenty zeros, which means that better than the atomic size. Uh, I mean distance measurement up to, uh, across 2.5 million kilometers. I, I just cannot believe that that's possible. It's, it's so sensitive that, that, I mean, the spacecraft cannot, cannot be kind of just lasers anchored there. They have an internal part where the lasers and the receivers of lasers are, and an external part which doesn't touch the internal part. So the external part kind of isolates the internal part from space. I mean, because you have radiation, solar radiation, some dust particles in space. This external part kind of keeps itself positioned somehow so that the internal part doesn't touch the wall, so that the internal part is freely falling, surely, and no, nothing disturbs it. <coughs> and the schedule launch is 2034. I mean, unfortunately, I'm long since retired for or, or otherwise inactive. Like <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, and the configuration is here. It's, it's on Earth orbit, kind of following the Earth. Following the Earth and, and cartwheeling. I mean, of course, it rotates once a year around the Sun because it's on Earth orbit. And the lifetime of that instrument is eight years, about somehow, not longer than that runs out of fuel. <coughs> yeah, fantastic, fantastic scheme. But this has been now ac accepted as the ESA, European Space Agency kind of science project, and then it's progressing. And uh, the LISA Pathfinder is this satellite. Which it was sent to space 2015 and 2016. It demonstrated that the technology works, and, and actually it exceeded expectation. It worked much better than than, than, than expected, so it really promised that uh, things work. <coughs> now the frequency window, it's much bigger than LIGO. Then it observes much smaller frequencies. <coughs> it's actually just at the right spot for this early universe gravitational waves. Here is the frequency. The, 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 the LIGO is up here, it's about 100 hertz. 100 times per second is, is, is the typical, typical frequency, which is the frequency of the black hole spinning of, uh, around each other. Here it's 1 millihertz or, or 100 hertz, so that one hour <coughs> typical, or, or, or fractions of hour typical frequency scale, where the LISA is, is sensitive. <coughs> it is sensitive there to, to, to massive, this kind of galactic nucleus black holes, which are rotating and, and uh, spiraling around each other because they are of course much bigger so, so, so that the times are slow. There's a third way to actually to, to, to measure gravitational waves at extremely low frequencies which is the pulsar 
networks. Pulsars are neutron stars which are spinning in space and, and, and emitting radio, radio pulses when they spin because they have some kind of hot spot. They are, they, they are extremely regular. I mean, they are, they are extremely precise kind of clocks. And now, when you monitor many of these pulsars and the gravitational wave of true, the distance between us and the pulsar changes. And so that it means that sometimes you, you see it spin kind of frequency is higher and sometimes smaller with the, with the typical sine wave. But of course, they are very distant objects, so that the frequency is extremely small, what you can do with this. These actually are, are active. They are active, these kind of pulsar timing arrays now, but nothing has been observed, so you probably haven't heard anything from them. And the object seen by Lisa uh, are here. This is the Lisa sensitivity. This is frequency. This is 100 of the hertz, 1,000, so that uh, 1,000 seconds per one oscillation. And, and that's the sensitivity, this green band here. And, and the, the maximum is about 10 to minus 21, so that uh, if you have one meter, or in this case, this 2.5 million kilometers, <coughs> I mean, it's the, this fractional change what it can observe there. And there are many objects which produce gravitational waves here. Supermassive black holes, for example, here is million solar mass black holes rotating around each other in, in some galactic nucleus that might be, and, and wherever in the universe they are, I mean, one cannot see it, see it here because the pulses are so. And then you can monitor them for a long time, I mean, month be before the, the merger, they are here, day before the merger, hour before the merger, and then boom, suddenly they hit each other. <coughs> And vanish there. And there are lots of binary star systems within our galaxy, what you can measure here. And, and, and they claim that they, they, they are thousands and thousands of binary stars here on this, on this color plot, but they can kind of catch them all. I mean, they can just do the Fourier analysis of all of them and then find that, 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 that individually can, can see them all, and that's why I kind of take them away. Cosmological signal, then, what it, what it is here. It's a stochastic noise, gravitational noise. Unfortunately, it's noise. Typically, these signals are kind of regular, kind of one note, whereas cosmological signal is noise. And, and, and noise, of course, is much harder to observe than, than one note. And the noise then has some spectrum, I mean, where, where the, which means that there is some amplitude at some particular frequency. And you have to understand all of this in order to kind of be sure that you are observing the noise, which is a signal and not due to just some kind of collective effect of these other sources. One can call this foreground. So as I mentioned, the transition proceeds to supercooling. Critical bubble nucleation, when these bubbles are nucleated, and then they grow and collide. And uh, if the latent heat and supercooling are large, then the, the, the process is violent. Superheated water is a good example. If you go to YouTube and look at superheating water, you see these experiments where people put distilled water on the microwave on a, on a very smooth, clean glass. You can heat it up, and, and it heats up way beyond 100 degrees until it explodes. Uh, the latent heat is being released. And uh, when I was a student, I actually calculated that, um, estimated that uh, you can fill the whole universe with pure water, heat it, keep it at normal pressure, heat it to 110 degrees centigrade. The lifetime of the universe is not enough to make the bubbles to fall. It's so metastatic. The, 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 the reason why water boils, of course, is the impurities that are in it. I mean, they act as nucleation centers. Or the boundaries, you, your kettle has edges, and those make it easier. But uh, pure water universe doesn't have boundaries. There are no walls there. So that, so that uh, and it's pure by definition. Universe contains what it contains. So that, uh, <coughs> so that uh, it can have strong metastabilities. 
So our goal is to take a set of these BSM models, candidates, and there are many technical names which I, I don't go to into here, and calculate how much they would produce gravitational waves and how they would be visible at LISA. Or conversely, how to use LISA observations to constrain these models. And this is a very worthy goal. I mean, this is exactly what is done in particle physics experiments. This is phenomenology of BSM theories. Now, this is a bit technical, and I think I should probably skip most of this. <coughs> but let me mention quickly. I mean, there are many stages, many, many stages what we must match <coughs> in order to make these predictions. We have to know the thermodynamics of this model, this candidate model, which means so-called equation of state or latent heat. What is the heat released when the transition happens? I mean, water has very big latent heat, for example. And then this critical bubble nucleation rate. And this, this is actually very important because this determines how deep you supercool and also gives you the length scale that is being generated. These bubbles nucleate, and of course, they have then specific distance from each other. They grow. But that gives kind of specific distance and specific fre frequency of the gravitational waves. And all technical details, the bubble wall fluid interaction. What I have marked here green means that this we know about. I mean, we, we can handle them. We know how to do it. There is a question mark here because this is, takes some work still to, 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 to make work. <coughs> and then at the last stage, we have to model the growth of these bubbles, collision of the bubbles, and what kind of flows, hydrodynamical flows they cause. Of course, this, it's filled with fluid, hot fluid, the universe <coughs> at this stage. And, and, and this, when these bubbles grow, I mean, there's all kind of turbulence and hydrodynamical flows. And this requires numerical simulations, and that's what we have done here. <coughs> we use effective theory. This is, of course, very much an effective theory where, where we, it contains hydrodynamics and, and then some order parameter scalar field. <coughs> and uh, gravitational wave production here is straightforward to measure. From the energy momentum, so called energy momentum tensor, but let's not go into detail. Okay, when the bubble walls, I mean, this now describes my bubble wall, what moves here. I mean, the Higgs field, which I call now my disorder parameter field, in the hot phase is here, down here, and in, the, in this whole low temperature phase, it it's goes to up here to the higher values. It wants to go up here, but because the this tunneling barrier, it cannot do it immediately. You have to nucleate these bubbles. And when bubbles are nucleated, then this wall starts to grow I and mean, move to this direction so that the field then drops, drops in this true value. But now it's universe filled with matter, fluid, hot matter. It pushes the fluid. It may, it, if, the, if the wall is slow enough, then it pushes the fluid in front of it. This kind of thing is called deflagration. Or if it is supersonic, it is faster than the speed of sound in the fluid. It's detonation. And then it actually tracks the fluid behind it. But nevertheless, in both cases, the, 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 when the bubble wall moves, it pushes the fluid or tracks the fluid with it. So, so, so even when they collide, this fluid movement then causes lots of flows, all kind of uh, uh, flow patterns in the universe. And these, uh, and, and these, uh, these uh, um, flows then generate gravitational waves. <coughs> so that the gravitational waves are generated in all stages here. Actually, when bubbles collide, these growing bubbles collide, that produces gravitational waves. But actually, not so, not so much, because it's clearly subleading. You also generate turbulent flows, which can be important. I'll return to that a little bit. But uh, it seems that the dominant part is sound, sound of the phase transition. <coughs> they, 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 because when they grow, they cause compression waves in front of them. Compression wave is just sound. So it's really kind of the sound of the popping of these bubbles. <coughs> and and, and the, the, the important thing is that when the bubbles collide and hit each, each other, and the system then is in this low temperature phase, this sound waves continue. 
they keep on, on running through the universe and they, their lifetime is much longer than the lifetime of these bubbles. And they, but they keep producing the gravitational waves. And that's the reason why this is really becomes the dominant source of the gravitational wave for that. It's, it's sooner or this is, yeah, okay, that's it. A couple of technical slides, how to, what equation of motion we are solving here, how it is implemented. But let us now look at the simulations. Here is a snapshot of simulation. One, bubbles are nucleated, they grow and, and, and go, go on. Let me show a, show a movie about one. <coughs> if you send a simulation volume, I mean, you can kind of see three-dimensional volume. It is empty now. This is in the kind of the hot, metastable hot phase. And then we run this code. Bubbles start to nucleate, they grow, and this is uh, hit each other. And now the transition is completed. It's, it's, it's smooth, but covered by the bubbles. But these sound waves, this is energy density. They plot it here so that you see kind of energy density waves crisscrossing. And they don't go away. I mean, simulation ended there, but, uh, but um, that's why they go away. <laughs> But, but physically, I mean, they, they sustain themselves for a long time. And these crisscrossing sound waves are the <coughs> things that produce gravitational waves. Actually, I had much, I think, almost hypnotically nice plot here. Sorry. This blue screen. Same process, but now in a little bit slower motion. Too slow. No. <laughs> <laughs> now it grows. I mean, there's a bubble growing. This now shows the, the velocity, fluid velocity, of oh, sorry, fluid energy density, so that you don't see difference between the in inner and outer part of the bubble. This is three-dimensional simulation, one slice through it. And you see bubbles are nucleate, being nucleated, and they grow and hit, hit each other all, all around all around uh, the, the <coughs> space. The, the growth speed is a fraction of the speed of light, so, so they are really growing very rapidly, of course, in, in our units, but uh, much lower still than, than the, I mean, the speed of light. It's a fraction of the speed of light. Now the transition has completed, the bubbles have swept through the whole space, but these shock waves, sound waves, are still propagating there. <coughs> all over the place. And, uh, okay, I mean, yeah, it, it doesn't develop anymore in a way. It, it looks looks the same kind of the, as long as you, you, you run, the, run the simulation. <coughs> but very interesting looking network of weights you, you obtain there. And go back here. The results are that we can measure the power spectrum of the of the system here. The, the, uh, uh, that's the uh, wave number at the x-axis, and the gravitational wave, uh, the, the, um, the amplitude on the y-axis. And depending on the speed of the wall, I mean, we get different shapes. If the walls, bubble walls are moving with the speed of 0 0.8 in, the, in units of light speed, so, so almost at the speed, close to the speed of light, very fast moving walls, then we get one particular kind of shape of the, of the gravitational wave power spectrum. However, if it moves close to the speed of sound there on the 0 0.56, then we get completely different power spectrum. And this can be, in principle, now used to, 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 to uh, 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 if we observe some kind of power spectra like that, I mean, that gives us information what happened there. So we can obtain thermodynamic parameters of the tail. And here is, uh, is a model how one does it with, uh, with uh, uh, I mean, when we when we use this power spectrum and put it on the on the on the on the um, 
compare with, uh, with the LISA sensitivity. Indeed, with some kind of prototype model, we can reach the LISA sensitivity, sensitivity region, so that in principle that is observable in this particular toy model. Here is the, what turbulence would give, give us, and that's the, 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 the sound wave. So sound wave clearly dominates in a wide range of parameters. Oops, no, I went too far. Okay, so the status so far. We, we still have not kind of done this full story. We, we have to do much more than we have done now. We know how to do this, how to obtain thermodynamics and thermodynamical quantities for any of these models. And it has been done, for example, <coughs> one particular person, this is for particular physicists, know what that is. We know how to calculate bubble nucleation rate that has been done for some kind of toy model, not the realistic model. Uh, this, how the bubble wall moves, the friction calculation needs, needs still some development. But this is all in microscopic physics. This now has been, uh, must be fed to these simulations, what I just showed. We can fix the parameters of this bubble growth and collision model, what, what we simulate then to, produ to produce the gravitational waves. And, and this whole chain has to be kind of done for a particular model in order to kind of obtain predictions for the model. I mean, how much that model produces gravitational waves. And we have done only kind of weak and medium strength transition, not strong transitions. But so far the results are very promising and indeed, indeed it has to be continued. So to conclude with here, gravitational waves, they are a new way to study particle physics. So it's really BSM phenomenology. Yeah, and energy reads, what we can do here is, is much higher than in accelerators. And we know in principle how to do it, how to connect the model to the gravitational wave spectrum. It's, there are many stages which are not fully done, but I mean in the future years we will do it. And, and we have kind of seen this, which was unanticipated before we started, uh, that the gravitational waves are really produced by the sounds, and that can be order of magnitude larger than other mechanisms. So it's a it's, it's promising outcome for the observations. And uh, also, this is, of course, <coughs> we are working in the context of LISA, but in principle, of course, this is also for any of the future or planned detectors, DESIGO, which is planned in Japan, and uh, two Chinese detectors are also kind of on the planning stage. These are not kind of at the same level as LISA. LISA is kind of going forward, but these are still kind of PowerPoint, PowerPoint detectors, but they have been seriously pursued anyway. An ultimate detector was this Big Bang Observer, which was something like 20, 10 years ago proposed. It's a huge co uh, uh, constellation of, 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 of 12 satellites, which beam um, lasers to each other. And uh, in principle, that would have had enormously range in frequency and in strain on this, on this, how sensitive it is to the gravitational waves. But I mean, that probably will never be realized. This kind of this kind of observ observatory is way too expensive and te technically also impossible to, probably impossible to do. But okay, thank you. I think this was my. Questions? Uh, we know there is a particle wave duality. So, what is the particle name for gravitational wave? Or is it any? Well, it's a graviton. Is the is the quantum of the of the, of the gravitational waves that has not been, of course, observed. I mean, the, the gravitational waves, what have been observed so far, are like waves in the ocean. I mean, you have huge uh, classical gravitational waves, what, what, what are detectable. Single graviton carries so little, let's say, energy at these frequencies that it is completely unobservable. 
and and um, and um, um, I don't. I mean, <coughs> unless you, you you propose some kind of very exotic theory of gravity, I mean, I think it really remains. Peter, um, in the LISA experiment, how? What does one do in order to keep the dimensions of that triangle constant within that that uh, error limit that you have there? They are not kept constant. I mean, they are allowed to move, but you know how they should move. And then you kind of subtract from this movement, uh, this uh, disturbance caused by the gravitational wave. So you just have to measure it to this accuracy, but not keep it constant. That would be probably impossible to, but, to keep it constant. But even though, even though you know Kepler's laws, yes. but uh, this system absorbs energy and gives energy away, which changes uh, the configuration. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. But uh, this is the the, the one of the thing uh, was this. Uh, I mean, uh, why it is isolated from the external disturbances? That the inner part is not. I mean, it's it's enclosed in the out outer part and free flying inside the inner part, so that the outer out outer part <coughs> protects it from radiation, dust, and and and, and so on. And uh, also the frequency is is the same. I mean, this triangle. Uh, it's big, it rotates once a year actually, whereas it measures once, I mean, millihertz, I mean, one hour frequencies, which is much higher frequency than these disturbances, gravitational disturbances would cause. cause. So that uh, it's, it's, it seems to be under control. <coughs> I mean, I, I trust the engineers. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? Sorry, yes, yes. I have two questions. The first one is after phase transition, right? You get the death. So some particles becomes massive. Yes. But so the energy density changes. Will this one impact the, the group? That generates group gravitational wave as well. And the second question is how how do you say it? if as you say you have different models, mm -hmm. right? It's like mini miles of symmetry or two yeah. SW model. They have different phase transition. That's right. So do we have like Say predictions to like or like uh, ability to tell which one is like the, the, the one you, you, you observe. Do you have that? I know it's dependent model, yes. but how do I you mean, one, one, uh, it's, it's true that uh, I mean, what, we, what you get from observations, if you observe something, you get some thermodynamic parameters. And you, of course, don't know which is the model which produces this. You can just get just a class of models which does produce these parameters. I mean, that's obvious. But I mean, all of these things that uh, some particles might become massive in the phase transition, it's in principle taken into account in the thermodynamical parameters of the theory. So that when we fix the term, I mean, the parameters of this final model, I mean, we calculate all of that, the desired accuracy. <coughs> So your bubbles are expanding in time, but uh, could you imagine instabilities where they could also collapse and create something like solar luminescence, I mean, releasing energy in that way? Uh, yeah, in, in, I mean, of course, I mean, at the final states, they do collapse or they do, well, collapse in the sense that the, when the volume left which is not swept by the bubbles. I mean, it's kind of a kind of negative bubble then, and that collapses. And and at the very end stages, that can be a very quick process. But um, so no luminance comes when the uh, like when it's contracting, right? Contracting, uh, yeah. And you have some light which bounces back and forth, and it's red shift. I mean, blue shift yeah. somehow, I guess. Yeah, I mean the the. Um, Similar kind of phenomena can happen here, but uh, probably the, we don't have so many scales. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, interesting question. I, mean, I should think about it. I, 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 I don't. Uh, I'll take into I, consideration. I'm just a low energy guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite possible that something interesting could happen there. I often <coughs> thought about that feature. Yes. So I have a technical. Are there further questions? So I have a technical. I mean, how much do the boundary conditions affect 
the actual you know universe is pretty big. Mm -hmm. How many? I mean, how many bubbles you accommodate in, in, in the actual simulations? Uh, yeah, I mean the, the simulations of course are strongly constrained by the just the computing power, yeah. and uh, we we at the, at most we have few thousand bubbles, and sometimes about 100. I mean, we vary it a lot because then you look at the different kind of kinematic range when you have many bubbles or or, or, or only few bubbles, then you allow them to kind of grow much more before they hit each other. And um, of course, in a perfect world, we would have, because in the real universe, the, the range is enormous, I mean, between the nucleated bubbles and uh, when they call like this, and orders and orders of magnitude scale separation. I mean, from microscopic to macroscopic, and and one cannot do it in a one numerical simulation, obviously. It's <coughs> but we, we we try to, of course, so <laughs> estimate the, the effects of that. Are there further questions? If not, let's thank again, Kelly. <laughs>